All right, so um, welcome everybody. So one thing that we discussed last time was the proper time interval. So let's see, do we have any, any volunteers to remind the class what is a proper time interval? The definition that we talked about last class? All right, how about Jared? Jared, you there? Mr. Crump? All right, so maybe you're not around. Arthur? Um, <clears throat> it was, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. It was the time interval that the person experiences, right? So we had a, a person that was doing something so that they could measure the proper time interval. You remember that, that part? Yeah. Uh, weren't they holding a clock or something? I'm so sorry, we... uh, you're too, your sound is too low. Uh, they were holding a clock with them so that way the time didn't like warp if the clock wasn't with them. Right, but he wasn't just holding the clock, right? One, if you're static and an event happens in a particular place and so you're walking with a constant velocity, constant speed, you see the event happen exactly where you are, and then you keep going, and then another event happens exactly where you are the second time. And you were measuring the time. So that's the proper time interval. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. So now, once you have this proper time interval, so the word proper, I don't know if, if any of you took French or no French? So the word proper is from the French proper, which means own. So this proper time is measuring its own time. That's the idea behind it. So you will have that the time interval between two events that occur at the same position in some reference frame, that's the proper time interval between the two events. All right, so then let's do a, a small example. Let's say that you are flying, you're flying in an airplane, okay? So you have a friend in the ground. So over here, is your friend in the ground. And then over here, you're in an airplane, right? So now you're flying in a plane, your friend is on the ground, and you, you guys have been on an airplane, right? So you see that there's this in-flight video program that they put in where they tell you what the safety is and blah, blah, blah. So the question is, who's measuring the proper time interval between the beginning and the end of this video, right? So you're in this airplane, the airplane is moving in this direction. This person is, excited, is, is just exactly in the same place, doesn't move. 
And the question is, you have a start of the movie. and B, in of that same movie. So who is the one that see, sees the proper time interval? The plain person in this moving frame or the one in the ground? And what I'm putting here is kind of like a reference frame, right? X, Y axis. Anybody? Would it be the person on the plane? And that's Kate, right? Yes. Exactly. So you have the, the person in the plane is the one measuring the right proper time interval. Yes. All right. So um, what else would I need to say? All right. So how about two signals from warning lights. So now there's a building right here. Maybe it's the tower control, right? And this tower control has two signals that pop out. So light pops out and signals out of it. Who would measure that proper time interval between two of those signals coming, the warning lights that are coming from this tall building. Anybody? Wouldn't that be the person on the ground? Why? So what's the reasoning behind it? Uh, the light doesn't have to travel as far because uh, the plane's farther from the, the warning light than the uh, person is. So the plane is farther away. So, so let's say the plane is here, right? And then this is when the first event happens. And then, then it's over here when the second event happens. So we have that one event happen, the light has to travel from here. Oh, you guys don't see my mouse, right? Let me change color. So the light travels from here to here, right? And then the next time the lights has to travel again from up here to here. And the frame of reference there moved. So that's exactly why the one in the ground doesn't have the same issue. The light traveling towards that in event A and event B is traveling the same distance. So what we have here then is called the reference frame. So this is the important thing, this reference frame reference frame is the one moving, this one is a static. All right, and that was Christian that said the last thing, right? Uh, yes. All right. So with that definition given, let me give you a couple more. So that's like a big concept, right? This proper time interval. Let me tell you a little bit more, a couple more uh, important definitions that are necessary for us to do a particular problem. And um, the most, so the most um, important concept from last time was the speed of light not changing. So that's called an invariant. So that's really important that Einstein said the speed of light is not changing you side on the video when you're traveling on the train and so forth, right? So we already know how to define proper time. So now before we get into time dilation, we have to look at something called the Lorentz factor. So Lorentz came up with this and it's the measure, this is the formula for it, the Greek letter gamma. And what it is, is a measure of how much relativity affects our notion of length and time. So this proper, this uh, Lorentz factor 
is one divided by the square root of one minus the velocity divided by the speed of light. So for instance, this is speed of light and this is not gonna change. This is the speed of light in vacuum. And it's about three times 10 to the eight meters per second. All right, so what is the Lorentz factor if you're moving at 10% um, the speed of light? So let's say that B is equal to 0 0.1 C. How would we do it? We stick that value here and we say one over one. And then this is 0 0.1 squared c squared divided by c squared. So at this point, the c is canceled, right? So this c and this c cancels out. And then all I have to do is figure out how much is 0 0.1 squared. Anybody know how much 0 0.1 squared is? Is it 0 0.01? 0 0.01, so you would be 0 0.01. All right, so that, that means that I need to know what is one minus 0 0.01, which is 0 0.99, and then take the square root of that. And then divide it by one. So this is the same as one over the square root of 0 0.99, right? And that means that I have one over, once I take the square root, I have 0 0.99, almost five. So it's not exactly five, but let's just keep it there. And if I go one over 0 0.995, hold on, did I did something wrong? No, perfect. Yeah, this is this much, 1.005. Okay, any questions about the, the math? All right, any questions about the concept that we're doing? So this is the Lorentz construction. Now, what that means is that when you're traveling at the speed of 0 0.1, 10% the speed of light, So this value right here, 0 .0, 0 0.1, the speed of light, that's actually gonna change things by about 0.5%. So in reality, it's gonna be really hard for us to, anything below this value, 0 0.1, it's gonna be really hard for us to tell that there's a relativistic effect happening. So if you look at it, how fast is the fastest uh, airplane traveling at? Any guesses to that? Five hundred miles an hour. So that would be a normal airplane, right? Normal airplanes that like the one that you take from here to Dallas, it's about 500, the cruising speed. But you have some that go at about 2,000. So there's the, the Blackbird, the SR-71. That one can travel about 2,100 miles per hour. So 
maybe there's faster than this, but this this is something that the military hasn't told us, right? But we have that this blackbird can go at um, 2,200 miles per hour. So let's say that it's going at 3,500 kilometers per hour. So if we look at this value, that 3,000 kilometers per hour, right? Let's make it 3,600 kilometers per hour. So just exaggerate it a little bit, right? And then if we look at that number, that means that it's going at 3,600, like this much, meters per hour. And since every hour has 3,600 seconds, this is going at 1,000 meters per second. So if we look at it, how much is if we if we compare the speed of light right if we're comparing this one that is three to the ten to the eight meters per second versus this one that is one times ten to the three meters per second we see that even our faster fastest airplane is not gonna have relativistic effects affecting it. Questions? No? All right, so then let me erase the board and make a new one. The next thing that we have to talk about is time dilation. So we know that this is the proper time between two intervals, between two events that are measured for an observer that is moving or for whom the two events occur at the same position, but at different time, right? So now, there's another one that we have that is somebody moving at a particular speed. So this is the time event, the time interval. Between two events, the same two event, for an observer moving at a particular speed of B. And then the way that those two intervals are related is that you will have that this time that you measure when you're moving at a particular speed is equal to this value when you have the proper time. All right, so then uh, some concerns that you might have or that I have had when I'm learning these things, right? Can you always measure this proper time interval? Is that something that can be done? Let's see, uh, anybody wants to share that? What they think? Well, wouldn't we just need to set like a stationary observer? Wouldn't that be what that would be used for? Um, so when you say, yeah, okay. So you're thinking, let's say that you have to have the observer, right? 
But the idea was that we had, this is from the, from the homework that you did. We had an event happening here, right, in A, and then this has to travel to the observer, right? So this is the eye of the observer. So then the other thing was that you have an event happening later, here's your observer still. And let's say that this is the second event. But then this has to travel too, right? What we want for the proper event though, is that when this happens here, you have your observer here And then if this event will happens again and he's static and this is blinking again, then this person is here there. So it's a light blinking and they're on the same position in space. So that's a proper time event between the two. That's what we had with the building. So now in the homework, what you had is that there was, uh, let me erase some of the stuff. In the homework, we had the following. Something happened here. This person is passing by and is running with the ability to measure the clock. And then, so this means that this person, their frame of reference is moving in this velocity. And then another event happened. And this is maybe another thing blinking another light and this same person is still walking in this direction with the same speed in that direction. And he was able to measure that time interval that happened between the two events. So now let me ask you something. What happens if the event that happens here and the event that happens here are separated by a distance that cannot be traveled in between the two, the time, in the time interval between them? Does that make sense? So for instance, if something happened in the, an event happens in the sun, and then an event happens on earth a minute later, can somebody measure the proper time interval between those two events? And remember the speed that you need to travel, the time that it would take for you to travel between earth and sun, it's eight minutes traveling at the speed of light. So could an event happen? Could somebody measure a proper time if it happens in the sun and then on earth, another the interval between two events, one happening in the sun and one happening on earth and the interval in between would be between two minutes. Is there a time interval, proper time interval to be measured there? You can't measure one, but Right, because there's, no, there's no proper time interval for those two events. So the proper time interval is very specific. It has to be, this is where relativity comes into play and it has to be that you're at both uh, places for that to happen, for you to be able to measure it. All right, any other questions? At this point, everything sounds clear to you guys or should we move on? So how do we calculate the proper time interval if, if it's not, if we can't calculate it, you know, by yeah, it doesn't too exist. far away? It doesn't exist. That means that it's a time, that time interval doesn't exist. So you wouldn't be able to measure it. Can't we use the, the equation that you wrote up on top? Uh, no, measure it I, ourselves and then, and then calculate with that the proper time interval. So to measure the proper time interval, you actually need to be in the same frame of reference as the thing happening, right? 
so so it was the event happening here and happening there you have to be able to travel between the two events so that the space between the two events in that frame of reference didn't change so let me give you another example well actually let's talk about a space-time interval so this is the thing that that einstein gets credit for so this lorentz construction that i put before tells you uh, how much time dilates, how much time stretches or something compresses or something like that, right? This factor gamma, which goes from one, when not moving, when not relativistic, but higher than one when your speed is over 0 0.1 C or larger. So that means that you measure a proper time and let's say that in proper time is one second, the person that is moving might be measuring 1.05 seconds or so forth. Depends on how fast they're moving. So now the thing that Einstein came up with that is really interesting. And this is a big concept from what was uh, taught at the time. Is the concept of a space-time interval. Why is this different from what everybody else was thinking at the time? So for instance, if you ask Newton, Newton's uh, space and time. Does that make sense? People before Einstein thought about a space and time. Einstein came over and said, the space and time are the same. There's no space and time, there's a space time. A space and time are cannot be separated. They're two things that are close together. Am I losing you guys here? This is the the point where you can ask questions too. Does space time mean uh the space you're at at a certain time or the time you're at at a certain space? Both, exactly. You have to know not just at what a space you were, point in space, right? So this is your position in space and this is your position in time. Well, yeah, let's call it position in time, right? So what Einstein said is that that's not the case. It should be all together you're not just in three dimension x y c you're actually in four dimensions because the fourth quantity that you have that describes what you where you are is intertwined between the when you are so the where and the when are together that's why space and time go together so this part that gets added here is einstein realizing we need to do this extra part. We don't just talk about this and this, but rather we're all together in the space time. Okay, questions? Does it make sense? Okay, so I see a question from Sivan. Yeah, they're saying, he said, the space and time are depending on each other. And it's especially important because if you're moving, the time interval that you measure, right, is different than if you're not moving. But when you're moving, let's say you're on a, on a bus moving at a constant speed, you don't feel like you're moving, right? You think that everybody else is moving past you when you're the one moving past them, something like that. So that's the, the big difference. You have to look at a space time interval as something both intertwined together. All right, so then let me give you the next uh, idea then for this space-time interval. 
this is the equation that Einstein came out. He said that the, this is the space-time interval, S, S squared. And this is the definition. You have the speed of light. So the speed of light times this time interval is squared minus the position the space interval changing position is squared. So let me define it. This is the speed of light. This is the time interval. And this quantity right here is the space interval. All right, questions so far? This concept is uh, uh, Yeah, go ahead. Um, delta X is the displacement in all three dimensions, right? Right. And it's just okay. distance, yeah, a number, the distance of the number. Anything else? How is a space time interval related to a proper time interval? Are they right. like the same thing? Or That's my things? next topic, my next concept to talk about. Good question. So when we talked about, about, um, Measuring the time, right? It depends on whether you're traveling or not. When they, whether you're at the, so the proper time interval is the one that happens, everything happens in the same reference frame. So if it's a building and you're not moving with respect to the building, you're in the right reference frame, with a light in a building blinking versus a person in the airplane flying by it. If you're the person in the airplane flying, and the movie starts inside the airplane, your frame of reference happens when the movie starts and when the movie ends happens to be exactly at the same place. So in that case, this time interval here is the only one that you have there. And this one becomes zero. When you're in the airplane and you start the movie, the time interval is the only one that happens to happen and this other quantity delta x is zero because you're in the same frame of reference. Now for the person in the ground, when the movie started and when the movie ended, because light has to travel from different points in space, you see that this delta x is not zero, right? For the person in the ground. Does that make sense? That for the person in the ground, delta x is not zero? But then delta t is going to be different than the one that the person in the airplane measured. And those two would compensate each other. So now this is the, the most important thing. We talk about invariance, and that's whether the speed of light um, changes or not, right? The speed of light is a constant value. Is c, the value of c is always 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. In this case, it doesn't matter whether you're moving or not, this space interval is gonna be invariant. Does that make sense? That is not gonna change. Because if you are moving with respect to somebody and measure both of those objects, you measure both, not, not objects, right? But you measure both intervals, delta t and delta x. If one of you is moving, then delta x is gonna be different from the other one in their frame of reference. 
but then delta t is going to change to compensate the two and this time interval can be measured okay questions No, we're good. All right, so when do you have to worry about this relativistic effects happening? That would be when you're traveling really fast with respect to somebody. How many of you have heard of the twin paradox? Ratio or kind of you have, or just put an emoji on the chat all right. So I think a few of you haven't. So the twin paradox says, let's see. Uh, Jason, do you want to tell us what it is? Sure. So it's the idea like if you have two identical twins and put one in a spaceship going off into space and the other one on Earth, mm -hmm. um, then whenever, like, they can be gone for the same amount of time, but then whenever the other one comes back, there will be a time dilation. So there'll be different ages. Exactly. So who gets older, the one traveling or the one that stays in Earth? Who the looks one that's Earth? traveling in a spaceship, right? Or the other, no, way. Right. other way around. Other yeah. way around. So as an example, let's go through some science fiction movies. How many of you have seen um, Planet of the Apes? either the original versions or the remakes. All right, so, well, actually they haven't gotten to that part. I guess the, the new versions, they're not really doing that. The old versions, right? So I, I don't think I have to, if you haven't seen it, I'm gonna give you a spoiler here, but this is a movie from the 60s. So if you haven't seen it, it's your fault, right? So the main characters, are sent from Earth, they land on a planet, they went really fast for um, their space travel, but they actually landed back on Earth. And there's something happened, and uh, at the end of the movies when he realizes he's on Earth because he sees the Statue of Liberty. But the idea is that for him, time was slow because he was traveling super fast. And maybe, I don't know how many years happened to pass on Earth, maybe it's a thousand years, whereas for him it's just one year or something like that. So that's an example of how somebody that is traveling really fast, in principle, because of this twin time dilation, the person could go in an intergalactic trip, and then uh, when they come back to Earth, they would be, maybe the, for them only four years pass, Whereas for the person on earth, more than four years passed. Now, another example of something similar, but it's not exactly the same happened in Interstellar. So you guys have seen that one too, right? Anybody not seen Interstellar? So in Interstellar, you have that uh, the three I think it's three of them go down into this planet where the gravity is really hard, really high. And somebody stays in orbit. So the person in orbit, I don't remember how many years he has been up there in orbit, but he looks really old when they come back. And they just spend one hour in the planet. So here, the time dilation is happening because of the gravitational pull that they had to endure because they're near a black hole. So the time dilation is happening because the space time, this is general relativity now, not a special relativity, but the space time is making it so that because they're near the, the, the black hole, time is flowing a lot slower than for the person that did not uh, experience so, so much gravity. But it's similar ideas as space time is very interrelated in that case. What happens to space when you're near a black hole? Anybody knows? 
Does it get stretched or does it get compressed? What do you guys think? Sure. Arthur, you said? Can you repeat? I want to say it compresses, but I think it might stretch. It is stretches, yeah. So that means that one gets bigger, right? Then what happens to the other one? So that's the that's something not a special relativity is general relativity, but you can see that that's what's happening. Like for instance, if you're falling into a black hole, you're gonna get a stretch and never survive it. So it's not like what happens in movies where you have that people would travel into black holes and nothing happens to them. Actually, you would get a stretch and your head or whatever goes in front gets a stretch so much more than the what's on the back that there's no way nobody could anybody could survive this. Except in movies, right? All right, so any questions? No? All right, so what we're gonna do then for next class is that we're gonna start working some problems. So these work problems, I'll give you, they're not ultra hard, but you're gonna be using the ideas that we have here. So for that, um, I'm gonna break you into groups through Zoom and you guys get to discuss on what is the approach to take to solving this problem. And then you come back from Zoom and then we discuss as the whole class, I'll ask one of the groups to present what they're thinking on how to solve it and so forth. So next class, make sure that you're ready to, to um, discuss with people. So have either your microphone or be able to, to type fast enough on the chat so that you can have a fruitful discussion in your groups. All right. So if there's no any, any other questions, at this point, um, um, we can leave early a couple of minutes. Um, I don't see questions. All right, I see Jason, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry, that was from earlier. Oh, okay, sorry. All right, got you then. So you all have fun, stay safe, and uh, see you next class. No homework today. <laughs>